Today, we're taking a look at the Fokker T4. Now, if this is an aircraft you've never heard of before, I wouldn't be surprised. It was a maritime torpedo bomber that was designed to be used in the Dutch East Indies, and like many other aircraft used in this theatre, it's often unfairly neglected by the history books. But today we're going to correct this, as much as the limited information surrounding this aircraft will allow. In the mid-1920s, the aerial capabilities of the Dutch East Indies didn't make for inspired reading. Almost all the aircraft were fighters or light bombers, most of which were obsolete. Even worse, there were almost no aircraft capable of striking enemy shipping or performing long-range maritime patrols. This total lack of air power at sea made the Royal Netherlands Navy uneasy, with many countries making huge advancements in aircraft development, some of whom were potential enemies, the defensive strength of their most important colonial asset had to be improved. After a brief period of contemplation, which mostly involved harassing the government to heed their concerns, the Navy dropped a requirement for a twin-engine heavy float plane and commissioned Fokker to build it. Their specification called for a four-seat, long-range aircraft that could fulfil the roles of reconnaissance, conventional bombing, and torpedo bombing. Almost all military aircraft at the time were biplanes, but Fokker had recently developed several large and reliable monoplane transports, and this layout was selected as the template for their new design for the Navy, the T-4. At first glance, it seemed typical of their previous designs, a relatively slab-sided fuselage with a thick, high-mounted cantilever wing. As with their other aircraft, this wing was constructed of wood, built around two full-span spars, and was clad in a skin of plywood. But unlike the other Fokker monoplanes of the time, where the wing was attached to the fuselage by a series of bolts, the wing of this design was not directly attached to the fuselage at all. Instead, it was attached to a framework that connected the wings, the engine mounts, and the floats, and then this structure would be connected to the fuselage via a series of welded joints. This was done to better distribute the impact forces when travelling over the water for takeoff and landing, particularly in rough seas, a consideration that would pay dividends later on. Though it looked basic in appearance, the fuselage layout of the aircraft was fairly advanced for something that was designed in the mid-1920s. Not only did it feature a dedicated cabin for the radio equipment, but it came with an internal bomb bay that could accommodate either four 200kg bombs or 18 50kg bombs, and it came with three defensive gun positions, one in the nose, one in the dorsal position, and a ventral position. The latter of these was retractable, as unless the gunner planned to engage submarines at pistol shot, the use of said machine gun was unnecessary when on the water. The fuselage structure was standard for Fokker designs, a framework of welded steel pipes reinforced at the rear with additional wire bracing, and all of it clad in fabric. It accommodated a crew of four, two pilots, a nose gunner who also acted as an observer, and a radio operator who also manned the rear turret. Initially, it was equipped with the 450 horsepower Lorraine Dietrich W12s, which drove a two-blade propeller. The prototype was completed in the spring of 1927, and it took off for the first time on the 7th of June. Despite looking ungainly, the T-4 performed well during its tests. It could complete its takeoff run from the water in under 19 seconds, and it achieved an initial top speed of 210 kilometers an hour. It completed a climb to 1,000 meters in just over 5 minutes, and it reached a ceiling of 4,200 meters. These trials showed good handling and manoeuvrability during flight, and the reports were equally positive when on the water, especially during tests in heavy seas. Despite its massive appearance, the T-4, with its cantilever wing and well cowled engines, represented a significant step forward in aerodynamics when compared to its contemporaries, such as the Farman F-168 or the Heinkel HE-7A. Satisfied with the performance of the prototype, the Navy purchased it into service and placed an order for 12 more to be built. The first of these were delivered to the Dutch East Indies in mid-1928, with the full batch delivered by the end of 1930. The career of these aircraft was a relatively peaceful one. They were only occasionally called upon for offensive action, and this was only in dealing with local pirate activity in cooperation with Dutch warships. The main tasks of the aircraft were to carry out reconnaissance flights in the coastal zones, and to conduct topographic surveys of the interiors. They also served as transports for the sick or wounded, and also for getting essential food and medicine into remote islands following severe weather events. 
By 1934, rapid advancements in technology meant that the T-4 was already obsolete. But the growing strength of Imperial Japan meant that more aircraft were needed to defend the Dutch East Indies, and Fokker was requested to develop a modernised version of the T-4. Significant changes were made to the forward section of the fuselage. The observer's position, pilot's cockpit and gunner station were all provided with glazed canopies, and instead of the open ventral position, a glazed turret was installed with two machine guns now selected as the standard. With the exception of increasing the wingspan to 26.4 metres, the rest of the airframe remained unchanged. That being said, the modified wing made it possible to accommodate new fuel tanks, increasing the capacity to 2,250 litres, and the power plant was changed to the more powerful 750 horsepower 9-cylinder Wright Cyclone. All of this meant an improved top speed of 260 km an hour, and an improved range of 1,560 km compared to just 1,200 km for the original. Twelve of these aircraft were ordered under the designation T-4A, and the first prototype was flown in the autumn of 1935. Originally, its engines drove wooden two-blade fixed-pitch propellers, but these were soon switched out for all-metal variable-pitch units, and finally, these would eventually be changed again to three-bladed units after they had entered service in Java. The T-4A retained the seaworthiness of its predecessor, but despite the performance improvements, it featured nothing radical or new in its design. Yes, the cockpit and turrets were now glazed over, but that was nothing revolutionary like it would have been a decade earlier, and the slow speed of the T-4A, when compared to potential enemies, meant that the torpedo bombing requirement was dropped, and it would only be used for reconnaissance, patrol, and medium altitude bombing if absolutely needed. In the end, it was mostly a means of bolstering the aerial forces of the Dutch East Indies until more modern equivalents could take their place. This would eventually come in the form of the new Fokker T-8, which entered mass production in 1938, and between that year and 1940, the Fokker T-4s were replaced in the frontline role by a mix of newer Fokker designs and imported aircraft. They continued to serve as secondary units, however, and saw frequent use as both transports and survey aircraft in the final years leading up to war with Japan. Ironically, for an aircraft that was meant to bolster Dutch aerial capabilities in the late 1930s, the T-4A ended up doing the opposite when one crashed in 1937, killing the newly appointed commander of the Dutch East Indies Air Units. That embarrassing moment aside, the T-4s soldiered on until the general mobilisation in the summer of 1939. The remaining T-4s and T-4As in service were organised into two air groups, and began performing more routine aerial patrols. This they did throughout 1940, 41, and after the outbreak of hostilities with Japan. During the campaign, several of the T-4s were initially used for bombing training, but all were modified to carry three depth charges and sent on anti-submarine patrols. The presence of far superior Japanese aircraft made these patrol missions increasingly risky. Aircraft were camouflaged and given new markings, but still suffered on the ground and during aerial attacks. In the end, their wartime service was short-lived. Due to the rapid Japanese advance, they could not be evacuated by ship, and flying to Australia was far beyond their range, even with stopovers. And so the remaining aircraft that weren't already destroyed were burnt by their crews on the 2nd of March to prevent capture. The production run of the T-4 was small, with only 33 being built, and their spiritual successor, the T-8, had its production curtailed by the German invasion. Pressed into action well after their time had passed, they were never destined to coat themselves in glory, but they still did their job to the best of their abilities. As always, thank you all very much for watching, and a big thank you, of course, to the Patreons, the people, the amazing people whose names are now on the screen here. A special shout out, of course, to the Wing Commander tier patrons, and a big welcome to Firestar, who is the newest member of this special group. Thank you, Firestar. Thank you, everyone and I will see you all next time. Goodbye.